Well, welcome back, brethren and sisters, to our series on inheriting God's promised land. You may notice that the format of this talk and the last talk in this series are slightly different. We had to re-record a couple of sessions, but uh, it's still the same material. So the story we're dealing with in this series about inheriting God's land is about inheritance. And inheritance was something that every Israelite greatly valued. The ownership of part of Abraham's land was important to them. It was a portion that God had appointed for them. Inheritance could not be sold, as we saw in the case of Naboth. Inheritance is always averted to the original owners in the year of Jubilee. It was God's gifted portion, and it was sacred to them that they kept that in the family. When we come to the story of Jephthah, we come to a story that is full of pathos and has become the scene of unending speculation about the fate of Jephthah's daughter. But let's remember that this record about Jephthah is meant to be be about the loss of inheritance. And that's the real theme we need to follow through. We will deal with Jephthah's daughter as we go along. But let me say right up front about Jephthah's daughter, it does not matter doctrinally what you believe actually happened to Jephthah's daughter. So we're entitled to be convinced in our own minds one way or other about her fate. But I'm going to present to you what I think is a quite compelling case for her at, at the end of this talk. This is a story that has been twisted and manipulated by Jewish scholars, by rabbis, by Christian commentators, and also confused by well-intentioned but inconsistent Bible translators who have interpolated their own feelings into the record. When we come to Jephthah's daughter, we actually are faced with conflicting laws that seem to apply, and we must sort out which of those laws apply in the situation that we find ourselves in. But we need to remember that with the incident with Jephthah, overshadowing all of it, is that the consistent, faithful, loving God of Israel is in control of all of these events. We might not fully understand Jephthah's motivations, but we do understand the values and the character of God, and that is the overriding factor in this story. You will find as we go along that there are places in the record that we have to make some suggestions and suppositions, and when we do that, we'll make it clear that that's what we're doing. But first up, I want you to note there are two things that the inspired record does say. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 32 and 33, we have the mention of Jephthah in the honour roll of the faithful. So Jephthah and, his, and by implication his very cooperative daughter are found there in the place where the faithful of the world are listed and they through faith subdued kingdoms and wrought righteousness. And it's so sad when you look at some of the Christian commentators to see how that Jephthah is characterized by them as a ruthless, thoughtless barbarian. And it's very, very much in contradiction to what God has to say in Hebrews chapter 11. The second point was, is that from verse 29 onwards in this record in, in Judges chapter 11, Jephthah was operating under the spirit of Yahweh. So his motivations were basically good and God was working with him, using Jephthah to perform his will against the Ammonites and against later on against some of the people of Israel. The fact that a man is under the spirit doesn't mean that he can never make mistakes. For example, we find the spirit of God came upon Samson at times and also upon David. That did not mean that their whole life was completely controlled. It wasn't mean their life was totally directed. Both David and, and Samson fell into grievous sins at times. They could make mistakes. But when it came to what God wanted to achieve, he was working through Jephthah. And Jephthah had been specially raised up by God for this moment, firstly to save Israel from the Ammonites, and later in chapter 12 to punish the proud and arrogant Ephraimites, and God achieved that in him in both cases. Well, of course, we come to the book of Judges with the very repeated pattern of sin, suffering, seeking God, and God sending a saviour. But before we get into the record, let's just get our geography correct in concerning Jephthah and Judges chapter 11. There are two mispars in the Bible record, and we need to sort out which of them we're talking about. This is not the city that you find over later in Benjamin near Jerusalem. That was one of the cities that Samuel had in his circuit. The event we're dealing with in Judges chapter 11 happens right over on the east of Jordan in a place called the land of Mizpah. It was part of Gilead's inheritance. You can go back to Joshua 11 and you'll see that this is what they were given. And it's interesting in this record, only the elders of Gilead are involved in dealing with Jephthah. So we know we're in the right place. 
Mizpah was the place where Laban and Jacob made their covenant when Jacob was returning from Padan Aram. And that's in Genesis 39 and verse 41. So it's somewhere north of the Jabbok. What is interesting is that the record in Judges doesn't speak of a specific city. It talks about Mizpah. It talks about the land of Mizpah. And it's more likely describing an area which was the place where the inheritance of Jephthah had originally been. And it sits well with that concept of inheritance that this chapter is all about. The land of Tob is well to the east of Mizpah, right over on the edge of the territory that Israel was to take from the Ammonites at that particular time. So it's right on the border with Syria and the desert of Arabia. We'll come back to those two places a bit later on. The Ammonite invasion came up from the south against Mizpah. So having got our basic geography correct, let's just now get our history in order. We need to see what was happening to the nation of Israel at this particular time. When we go back to Judges 10 and verse 6 to 8, we find that the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of Yahweh. They served Balaam and Ashtaroth and the gods of Syria and the gods of Zidon, the gods of Moab and the gods of the children of Ammon and the gods of the Philistines, and forsook Yahweh and served not him. And Yahweh's anger was kindled. He sent against them the Philistines and the Ammonites. They vexed the children of Israel 18 years. So there was a, a long oppression that came upon them because of their idolatry. And that's just part of that repeating pattern over and over again. And we say, we hear there that they were sore distressed, begging God for help. And finally, God accepts their repentance and sends Jephthah to save them over in the east. And probably over in the west against the Philistines, we have Samson coming into play as we read from chapter 13 onwards. And you need to be aware that the history of Samson and the history of Jephthah uh, tend to overlap. So here we are in chapter 10, verse 17. Israel is under threat of the advancing Ammonite army. The Gileads, the Gileadites all come to the land of Mizpah. Remember, not the one in Judah, but they come to the one over on the eastern side of Jordan. And from there, they make an appeal to Jephthah and his army of mercenaries who are based in Tob. So having got our geography right and a little, little bit of background about why this was necessary, we come to the, to the background story from chapter 11, verse 1 onwards. Now, in chapter 11, verse 1, we have a man called Gilead. This is not the actual grandson of Manasseh. Uh, he inherited Bashan east of Jordan way back in the book of Judges. He would be long dead by now because this event in Judges chapter 11 occurs well into the last years of the 400 years of the Judges. It's probably likely that to honour their famous ancestor, the name Gilead was used often in the tribe of Manasseh, and Jephthah's father bore that name. His father named his firstborn son Jephthah, and that means very simply God opens. And by implication, God opens the womb. When you go through the record of God in the law of Moses, he often refers to firstborn sons and firstborn of beasts as that which openeth the womb. And God uses that term quite frequently. So I think Jephthah was saying, this is my firstborn. This is the one that has opened my life as far as having children. From the naming, it seems the father wanted him to have the family inheritance which would be a double portion compared to the other sons, the family headship, and so forth. But there was a problem. We're told that his mother was a harlot. She was not even a concubine. And other legitimate sons later on came when, Jephthah, when, when uh, Jephthah's father actually got married. So a number of years go by, and they, the boys all grow up, and you've now got Jephthah the oldest, and you have his brothers who are legitimate children, and... We now come to a time, probably some 20, 25 years later, when they began to assert themselves. Very likely by now, Jephthah's father was dead. So what now happens is the younger sons, with the support of the tribe of the Gileadites, decide to forcibly get rid of Jephthah. When you read it says there they thrust him out, it's a very strong term in the Hebrew. They threw him out. And it was a, a very ignominious exile that he then had to in, endure. Now, they could have had plenty of grounds for doing this. When you go to Deuteronomy 23, this is the Net Bible, it talks, a person of illegitimate birth may not enter the assembly of Yahweh to the 10th generation. No one related to him may do so. So, you know, you have this tremendous exclusion from 
God in Deuteronomy 23 verse 2 about illegitimate children. And, and I just leave a question with you there because, you know, Ezekiel makes it very plain is that, you know, children do not bear the iniquity of their father. And, and we just need to be able to balance that. So there's one for you to think about and to, to work out the answer to that conundrum. But they had grounds. They could have used the law in such a way. They could have also talked about Abraham and, and Ishmael and casting out the, the, the son of the concubine. They could have talked about the sons of Keturah that Abraham sent away from his son Isaac. They had plenty of grounds to make this action against Jephthah. But we notice in verse 2 the key to this whole chapter. The expulsion was a battle for inheritance. His brother said, Thou shalt not inherit in our father's house. So there it was very clear. It was that actually a battle over inheritance. And that sets the whole theme for the chapter. It's vital with, when we come to the end to actually know that that's what we're talking about. It's a matter of inheritance. So in verse 3 of, of Judges 11, Jephthah fled east to Tob. It seemed to have been an ignominious flight, and he never forgot the humiliating disgrace that it was to him. When you look at the map of where he went, he went right across to the very edge of the territory Israel had conquered into the land of Tob and perhaps even into the land of Syria itself. It seems some later comments made by Jephthah that the tribe was very complicit in his humiliating expulsion. He was ejected from his family inheritance. He had nowhere to farm. He wasn't wanted in that area. And so he went out right to that far edge in the east. And chapter 11, verse 7 tells us he bitterly resented this expulsion and that he blamed the whole tribe who had supported his brothers. He says, you all hated me. And he reminds them that when they, when they actually ask him to come back to fight for them. Well, in verse 3, when he went east, he gradually gathered a gang of mercenaries. And you can actually go through the Bible and world history, and you will see that this is what usually happens when a, a leader is exiled. They hire mercenaries. They, they get armies that they pay, men paid with the plunder that they get. And it says they went out with him. And they went out, out after spoil. It was a wild bunch of armed men that had been assembled by Jephthah. So in Tob, they're over there, and it's right on that very eastern part of the land. Later on, we find in the Bible record, about 100 years later, that the, the Syrians actually hired mercenaries from Tob. And you get the impression that what Jephthah started by having a mercenary army in this area continued right down through history, and, and the men of Tob were actually hired by the Syrians to fight against Israel, and, and Joab and David had to fight against them. But they were mercenary soldiers. So even 100 years later, there was still a gang of mercenaries out in this area of Tob. Spartan country, harsh life, and they bred very fierce fighters. So we see that Jephthah and his gang were out there in the east in Tob, and, and they had a reputation for being very violent, aggressive, and powerful warriors. Now, all of those things about Jephthah's family happened some 25 years before we come to the story of Judges chapter 11. He'd been exiled, and now they want him back. We perhaps just need to offer some suggestions about the age of Jephthah as we go through this record. So he was born in the land of Mizpah. Other legitimate sons were born later and they grow up. So by now, perhaps Jephthah is 30 years of age. He's thrown out and exiled to Tob for many days. So let's say he was thrown out at the age of 32. He creates an army of mercenaries, let's say 35. He has an only child, a daughter, and she's grown up to maturity. So perhaps another 20 years have gone by. So he's probably around about 50 to 55 at this stage as we come to Judges chapter 11. In Judges 11, he defeats Ammon. He goes on to humble the Ephraimites in chapter 12. And six years later, he's dead uh, in, in chapter 12, about the age of 60 to 61. So it's important to remember there are two 20-year gaps in, in the chronology of Jephthah's life, 20 to 30 years before his brothers throw him out and at least probably 20 years before his daughter comes to maturity uh, to, be, to, to participate in Judges chapter 11. And that, that's just a little interesting thinking about the age of Jephthah. What is important is that for all those bitter years of exile, he had no family inheritance to farm. He had to fight battles to exist, operating as a mercenary force, plundering the Canaanites and the Ammonites in that area. It wasn't a great way to live for somebody who valued the inheritance with Abraham.
So an appeal comes. In chapter 11, verse 5 and 6, the elders of Gilead are desperate. They want him to become their military leader. And they says, come and be captain over us. So the first offer was just to be a military commander. But Jephthah wants more than that. When he refuses to come, they offer him much more. They offer him the headship. And the word in the Hebrew is the rosh. The tribal headship is now offered to Jephthah if, the, if he's victorious against the Ammonite. And so he accepts that offer. He then makes a public ceremony of it, so there'll be no doubt of his future authority if he wins this battle. So now the deal has been struck, that he's going to come back, he's going to bring his mercenaries, and he's going to fight against the Ammonites, and if he is victorious, then he will be head over the tribe of Gilead. Both parties in this invoke Yahweh to their vows, and Jephthah has to admit that the victory can only come with God's support. We also notice in verse 34 that when he comes back to the land of Mizpah, he, he now re-inherits his own house. We're told that when he came back, he came back to his own house in Mizpah of Gilead. So the lost inheritance that had been lost when he was thrown out was regained when he came in from Tob and came to the land of Mizpah once again. So Jephthah having come back, we now have in verse 12 to 28 the fruitless negotiations that take place with the Ammonites. When you get to verse 29, we find that Jephthah is moved by God's spirit and he's thinking godly thoughts. He was right in defending God against the evil motives and the lies of the Ammonites about why they were coming to battle. His argument based on history was right and correct, but the Ammonites had clear military superiority and so they wanted to fight and plunder. And so he got no answer to his last will reason argument. However, the negotiations with the Ammonites gave him time to organize his armies. So from verse 29 onwards, he sweeps through Gilead, raising an army, getting weapons and supplies. And he comes to Mizpah and made that his headquarters. He's got his own house back, as we noted from verse 34. And you can be bet, you can be sure that was on the inheritance that he had once lost. You can imagine his brothers being put in their place. And also the great fear they would be in. But how much more would they fear when he came back victorious? And they were in a, a very, very dangerous situation from this man because he never forgot the shame they'd put him through. It's all also quite apparent when you go to chapter 12, verse 2 of Judges, that there was an appeal for support made to the Ephraimites on the western side of Jordan. That was their brotherly tribe. Ephraim and Manasseh were the sons of Joseph together. But that appeal to the Ephraimites had been rejected. So it's to God alone that, that Jephthah had to go. And realising this was a tremendous thing to ask, that he would be sure to win this battle, he made this vow, which we often talk so much about. He needed divine intervention. So having made that vow, like all smart warriors, Jephthah knows that a surprise attack is the best means of defence. You might remember the 1967 war in Israel. Within the first three hours, the Israeli Air Force had decimated the Egyptian and Syrian Air Forces and assured themselves of a very fast victory. Sometimes attack is the best means of defence. So Jephthah attacks the Ammonites. But let's talk about the vow first before we get into that battle. Jephthah's vow was to offer up someone and it was made with a view to getting victory without fail, as verse 30 says. He wanted an absolute guarantee that this battle would be won. Without this unlikely victory, his regained headship position and his family inheritance would be lost again. Now, as we consider this vow, there's a few things we must remember. Remember those two qualifying points about Jephthah? He's there in Hebrews chapter 11. By faith, they subdued king kingdoms and wrought righteousness. And from verse 29, as he went against the Ammonites, he was acting under the spirit of God. So this was not a rash, thoughtless, ungodly vow, as some commentators assume. Jephthah even allowed God to choose the person from his kin who would fulfill the vow. Now, list a few things about vows we need to know. In God's eyes, vows are very important. Vows made as conditional promises had to be fulfilled. When you vow a vow to God, do not delay in paying it, for he has no pleasure in fools. Pay what you vow. Better not to vow than that you should not pay. 
And God says, just be careful. Don't make rash vows. Don't say later on it was a mistake. God will not be pleased with that. And we have, of course, the classic case of Hannah, who, who actually fulfilled her vow to the letter. For this child I prayed, Yahweh has given me the portion was I asked of him. Therefore, I have lent him to Yahweh. As long as he lives, he shall be lent to Yahweh. So vows must be honoured. So you don't make vows lightly. So what was it that Jephthah actually vowed? Well, we need to get some poor translation sorted out in verse 31. It was a person to be offered. Now, you'll find in some translations they have put in it in the record. Well, no, it's actually male singular. I will offer him, as Rotherham correctly translates it. I will offer him. And then the interlinear Bible corrects the rest of the verse. He shall belong to Yahweh and offer him instead of a burnt offering. So he was going to offer to God something greater than an animal. You know, the translators put in it hoping that that perhaps a dog or a, a cat or something would walk out of the house and that would be offered. Well, it ha would have to be a clean beast to be an offering anyway. But that's not what Jephthah said. He said, I'm going to offer a person instead of a burnt offering. And you can correct that from your interlinear Bible. Um, he shall belong to Yahweh and I will offer him instead of a burnt offering. So what was Jephthah's thinking when he made this vow? Well, I believe Jephthah was probably intending to make one of his brothers a servant of the tabernacle service, somebody who was dedicated to serve God for life. Remember Samuel? For all his days, he would be dedicated to Yahweh. So I think Jephthah was going to offer somebody from his brothers to go and become a servant in God's tabernacle. It's likely he had in mind offering one of those brothers who had rejected him, maybe the oldest especially, who had usurped him as the firstborn in that house. They all still lived in Mizpah. And you can imagine that it would be very convenient for Jephthah to get rid of one of the, the brothers, particularly the oldest, and send him away to be serving in God's tabernacle. But Jephthah did allow God to choose which brother it would be. These brothers must have feared a massacre when he came back victorious or some form of, of bitter revenge for the humiliations he'd been put through and for the sufferings he endured for so many years cut off from his inheritance because of their actions. But when he got back, there was a great surprise waiting for him. On his return to Mizpah, he found his daughter was there. Now, very likely, she had been brought in by his, his brothers. They brought her in from Tob while he was away, with the view to calming him down when he returned. Because they feared his revenge when he came back victorious, what better way to calm down a father than to have his daughter present? And fathers of much-loved daughters will understand how they have a very strange way and a very subtle way of getting through our defences. What better way to keep him merciful and kind than have his lovely only daughter there to greet him when he returned? It's very obvious that Jephthah never imagined she would be there when he came back. He would never have made a vow had it been possible that she would have been one of the people that God might choose. He had left her in tow. If you just think about it, just from a point of logic, if she had been there at Mizpah when the vow was made, he would have expected that she would be the one most likely to come out to meet him and to rejoice with him. And surely if that had been the case, had she known about that vow, he would have warned her not to do that. When we approach this particularly difficult topic, we must first remember that God is in control of all these things. He is the only perfect and consistent participant in this whole record. And God has eternal principles that do not change. So the victory was gained and the Ammonites were driven south right back to Heshbon. But let's talk about God's law. Right back in Genesis chapter 9, verse 5 and 6, God made it clear that men were not allowed to kill other men unless God directed them to. So he said there in Genesis 9, verse 5 and 6, And surely that your blood of your lives will I require. At the hand of every beast will I require it, and at the hand of every man. At the hand of every man's brother will I require the life of man. Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God made he man. And the God who made his children to be, to be in his image has no delight in those people of faith like Jephthah's daughter being put to death by their own relatives. 
absolutely against the principles of God. So God abhorred human killing, and especially for worship sacrifice. Later on, we find that God made it very clear that he abhorred the offerings that the Gentiles and the Canaanites made to their gods, and particularly to Molech. God says in Deuteronomy 12, Thou shalt not do so unto Yahweh thy God, for every abomination to Yahweh which he hateth, they have done unto their gods. For even their sons and their daughters they have burned in the fire to their gods. And, and God's quite clear. I absolutely hate that, that people would burn their own children. He goes on to say in Deuteronomy 18, When you are come into the land which Yahweh thy God giveth thee, you shall not learn to do after the abominations of these nations. There shall not be found any among you, anyone that maketh his son or daughter to pass through the fire. So absolutely impossible that Jephthah would have done this to his daughter or even done it to one of his brothers. You just don't do this if you're actually following the great and the mighty God. And you can go right through the Bible and you find this is a consistent principle. In the book of Jeremiah, the people of Israel are condemned for worshipping Molech. It says there in verse 31, they've built a high places of Tophet, which is in the valley of the son of Hinnom, to burn their sons and their daughters in the fire, which I commanded them not. And God says, these are abominations. Ezekiel 16, verse 20, you've taken thy sons and thy daughters, which you have borne unto me. You know, they are they are they should have been for God's glory, for reflecting the glory of the Father. And these you have made sacrificed unto them to be devoured. Is this of thy whoredoms a small matter? So again, this is one of the really things that God hates about the false worship around the, the children of Israel in Canaan, was the fact that they actually burnt their children to their gods. Ezekiel 20, when you offer gifts, you make your sons to pass through the fire. I will not be inquired of you, says God. I will not listen to people who actually burn their children in the fire. So you can be pretty sure, can't you, that God would not have expected Jephthah's daughter to be burnt or even to have to be offered as a burnt offering in any way. So these things are, are something that we can be very sure about. There's actually a, a little incident in... Um, Second of Kings chapter 3, when the children of Israel were besieging the city of Rabbah in Moab, that the king of Moab in desperation uh, took his eldest son that should have reigned in his stead and offered him for a burnt offering upon the wall. And this is something that the Gentiles did to, in order to invoke their gods. And there was a great indignation against Israel, and they departed from him and returned to their own land. So, again, you can see this something that the Jews absolutely hated to see happen. So we're very clear, aren't we, that, that human sacrifice is something that God does not want to see or to have. When we come to the law of the firstborns, where every firstborn was to be dedicated to God of man or beast, God says in Numbers 18, everything devoted in Israel shall be thine, given to the priests and the Levites. They, they would be the people who would take it on behalf of God. But... Every firstborn was devoted to God in some way. Everything that openeth the matrix, which then, then of course, is the meaning of Jephthah's name. You know, God opens. He, he saw it as God giving him a child. They which, which belong to Yahweh, whether it be men of beasts, shall be thine. But nevertheless, the firstborn of man thou shalt surely redeem. The first thing of unclean beasts thou shalt redeem. So we find that God has a as a very clear law about firstborns, you have to redeem a human firstborn and you have to redeem an unclean beast because God doesn't want an beast offered to him upon the altar or even given to the priests. But if it's a, a clean beast, then it has to be uh, taken to God and burnt as a burnt offering. So, again, very clear from that law that God would not have human sacrifice on his altar. And when you think about it, it's so consistent with a God who hates killing to require a faithful girl to be a sacrifice. Can you just imagine what it would be like for a human to be a burnt offering? And when you go back to Leviticus chapter 1 and you see the process, that they would be publicly slaughtered, their blood would be caught, they would be skinned, cut into bits. Quite a gruesome procedure. How could Yahweh ever condemn Molech after approving anything like that? Absolutely impossible that that could happen. Now, when you go through the law of Moses, you will find cases where God does require certain people to be burnt, and they were always immoral people. The harlot daughter of a priest, for example, would be, have to be burnt. 
But like Achan, they would first be stoned and then their bodies would be burned. In other words, given no proper funeral. You might remember the Lord Jesus Christ often spoke about the shame of Gehenna. But humans were never used for positive sacrifice. So you could have cases where God would have people burnt if they were totally immoral people, but burnt after they were stoned so that there was no proper burial for them. They would always be held in shame and contempt. When you think about human sacrifice, God did not even allow the compliant and willing Abraham to endure such a horrific and unforgettable moment as putting a knife in his own son. And the fact that God showed mercy to Abraham in sparing that horrific episode that he was prepared to go through with, and to all fathers who would hate the idea of sacrificing their own children, it really puts tremendous weight on the vital sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ, God's only beloved son, that God did give for the sins of the world. And we can only imagine, can't we, that that's one sacrifice that actually was done with great anguish on the part of the father. So it's quite impossible to, to think that there was a human sacrifice of Jephthah's daughter. God would never honour a vow or participate in a vow that involved human sacrifice as its price. What God did accept was people being dedicated to, to temple service. That is, going to Shiloh at this particular time in history where around the tabernacle there appeared to have been a, a lot of buildings constructed that would be storing the tithes, that would be actually taking in all of the uh, first fruits that came in that would be uh, providing accommodation for the priests and the Levites and the Nethanims. The city would have been quite a city built around the tabernacle in Shiloh. So what God accepted was people being dedicated to service at Shiloh. What better example can we have than Samuel, devoted by his mother at, at a very young age to go and serve there? As head of the clan, Jephthah could have required a brother to serve for life at Shiloh. And his daughter accepted his vow and honoured it, and she went there. When you go right through the Bible, you find people who were dedicated to the tabernacle or the temple in some way. The tricky Gibeonites who had deceived Joshua, they were later called Nethanims. They had to stay there and look after the supply of water and supply of wood for the service of the tabernacle and later on for the temple. So again, they had, for the rest of their history, a dedication to that work. The Levites became totally dedicated to God, Numbers 8, verse 11 and 15. And the Levites had special service. They had restrictions on them which other people did not have about who they could marry and about many of the moral codes as well. They had higher laws than many other people in Israel. So again, they were dedicated to a particular form of service. There are many women who worked around the tabernacle site at Shiloh. We know that some of those were abused by the sons of Eli. But there were women who were there to perform many tasks around that building and around that service. The sons of Korah became dedicated doormen and watchmen in the temple at night. And so again, they had a role that they dedicated themselves to, and that was their temple service. So Jephthah's daughter had to go there and stay there for the rest of her life and therefore could not marry and go and live with her husband. She could not have children, but she would serve in the temple all her life. And just think about the amount of work that was involved at these places of worship. Just handling and processing and preserving and storing and drying, all the things that came in, in tithes and first fruits. Think of the amount of quantities of, of offerings of the things that came in by, by fruit and other things at feast times. Think of the caring for the widows and the fatherless and the poor and the strangers. That was part of the distribution of the tithes and the offerings. Israel had the world's first ever public welfare system. And there would have been many things that were to be done around Shiloh and just processing all the food that came across their threshold. There were the Levites and the priests that had to be supported in so many ways. And you can imagine how much work there was for these faithful women who dedicated themselves to that task. So I find it not surprising that there was a place for Jephthah's daughter at Shiloh. Now, one of the objections that's always raised when you talk about this is Leviticus 27, verse 28 and 29. And some people would use that, apply that to Jephthah's daughter to say that she had to be killed as a sacrifice. Let's check it out in its own context. 
So when we come to Leviticus 27, we are dealing with a chapter that is all about vows and things which have to be redeemed and the process of redeeming them. So it talks in verse 1 and 2 about singular vows or a, a dedicated or separate vow. And we're talking here in verse 1 to 25, we're talking about free will gifts made to God, free will offerings you make. This was a case where you said, I, I feel gratitude towards God, and therefore I'm going to dedicate somebody from my house. I'm going to dedicate my house, my land, my animals. I'm going to give something to God as a gift or a gesture of gratitude. And you could do that. You could actually make this gift, but it was not a vow that like Jephthah made where, where he said, if you do that, then I will do this. And we might just call that perhaps a a bargain type vow, just to make the distinction. These were free will offerings that you made out of a sense of gratitude. So in verse 1 to 25, we have a process whereby you could actually redeem the vow. Sometimes the promised object of a free will vow proved to be impractical. The person might not be able to go. You might change your mind about certain animals that you had vowed. You might change your mind about some of the land that you had vowed to give to God. And you could only ever give it to God until the year of Jubilee anyway. So you could actually withdraw the item that you had vowed and you had to replace it with something else and particularly money. So the original form could be changed if it became impractical, provided, of course, that the spirit and the sacrifice that you were making was maintained or even increased because of the fact that you had not got it correct in the first place. You could redeem the item or person you had promised, often paying more than the value to do so. So if you'd vowed an animal and you changed your mind, you'd have to pay the price of the animal plus 20%. So it was something you didn't do lightly. But God was realizing that people make, you know, um, very spontaneous gestures of goodwill and free will. And sometimes they prove to be impractical. So there was a way to redeem your way out of it. This is a totally different type of free will vow from the one we get in Judges 11, verse 30, a without fail contract that Jephthah made. Those vows have two sides. If you do this, then I will do that. This is just a straight gesture that people make and perhaps don't think it through completely. So there's a process in verse 1 to 25 for estimating the value of a person that you have dedicated or an animal or even lands. Now, when you come to the estimations that are about people, we find that there's a formula given, and it's actually the priests making a valuation. The fact that when humans are redeemed, that there are quite significant variations reflected the ability of that person to perform manual work. So. Males of a certain age are the highest value, and then you have females of a certain age, and you have young people and so forth. And everybody has a certain value upon them because of their ability to work in the fields. So there was an estimation put on by the priests, and it was consistent for every person redeemed. Now, one of the reasons for this was that God did not want the ultra-rich coming along and actually um, making a big show of their piety by offering more than other people could offer putting up excessive prices for the redemption of their item or their person. So everybody had to pay the same amount. But at the same time, when you come down to verse 8 of, of Numbers 27, our very merciful God provided that when a person was poor and wanted to make a change, that there could be exemptions made for poor people who could not afford the regular standard price. So that's the law of redeeming free will offerings that you make. When you come to verse 26, we are talking about firstlings. And this is getting back to the, the law of Numbers, chapter 18. Every firstling belonged to God. So you couldn't make a free will vow of a firstling. You couldn't make a free will vow of clean animals um, or even a firstborn child because they all belong to God. They cannot be used as a free will vow offering. So verse 26 is simply saying that, that God already owns them. God's already committed them to himself. Firstborn of clean beasts were always sacrificed with no exceptions. 
In verse 27, an unclean firstling beast had to be redeemed or sold because God could not accept an unclean beast as an offering upon his altar. Again, you had to pay a price or you had to have it sold and the money went to the priests because you had to make a sacrifice of some sort. But all that saying in verse 26 and 27 is you can't offer as a free will offering something that already belongs to God. Firstlings belong to God and all clean animals must be put on the altar. So that sorts out verse 26 and 27. It was just an aside from the first 25 verses about free will offerings. Well, then we come down to verse 28, and we come to this term devoted things. Now, these are different to sanctified free will offerings that we find in verse 2 onwards. Things devoted are things which are not redeemable by money. Now, you can see this in Hannah's vow. We'll just go forward to that. When Hannah came and brought Samuel back to the, to, the, to the high priest Eli, she said this, Therefore I have lent him to Yahweh, as long as he liveth, he shall be lent to Yahweh, and he worshipped Yahweh there. So the little boy was brought along because she prayed and she made a bargain with God. You give me a child and I will dedicate him back to you. So this was a devoted child. This was a child that had been devoted before his birth and he now must be paid in full. It must go back as she had promised to God at the very first place. So he was a devoted thing. It's not like a, a, a separate free will offering. You cannot buy back something which is devoted in that way. Now, there are three things which are devoted. But before we go to that, I want to just finish off this slide about devoted things, where it says in verse 29, as Rotherham correctly translates it, as touching anyone devoted who may be devoted from among men. Notice that the AV has got of men, which sounds like it's talking about humans. No, anyone devoted from among men. So that's what we're talking about. A person who has been devoted would be a firstborn, for example, or somebody else that God has devoted. And we're going to make the point that God alone can devote men to destruction. Canaanites, Amalekites, and the men of Jericho and their goods were all devoted by God for total annihilation. So just going forward, the three categories of things which are devoted, and remember we're in Leviticus 27 verse 29, so there are three things that are devoted which God already has a right to. So a reciprocal vow is made with God, e.g. Jephthah said, I want a victory without fail. You can't come back and say, well, look, I'll give you money instead. So you can't buy it off as a free will vow could be bought back. There are things that God has already decreed are solely his, all the firstborns and the tithes. They are off limits for use as free will vows. You can't go and offer your tithes, which are already belong to God anyway. And there are things or people that God devotes to destruction. So God has condemned some people to be annihilated, and you can't buy them back. So there's a classic type of um, devote, uh, reciprocal vow made by Jacob. When Jacob was leaving to go to Paden Aram to seek a wife and to get away from Esau, we have a classic case of a reciprocal vow. And Jacob vowed a vow saying, if, now in the Hebrew it actually means because you will be with me. So he's accepted God's assurance of protection and will keep me in the way that I go and give me bread and to eat and raiment to put on, so that I come again to my father's house in peace. And notice he wanted to come back in peace because when he left, he was in great danger from Esau. Then shall Yahweh be my God. So there was a lot of conditions that Jacob put in that. Um, I'm not going to starve. I'm going to be looked after. I'll have clothes to wear. Um, and I'll come back to my father's house in peace. So God, if you do that for me, then this stone, which I've been sleeping on, which I have set up for a pillar, shall be God's house. And so he made the name Bethel come into being. And all that thou shalt give unto me, I will surely give the tenth unto thee. Notice again the, the sureness of that. I will surely give to thee the tenth. And what is remarkable about that is that this became a devoted thing. The tithes became one of the devoted things that you could not offer in any other way. It had to be always to God. Let's just talk about what it means to devote something. The word devoted is from the Hebrew karam or kirim, depending on the direction in which it's, it's made. 
The meaning is to seclude, to isolate, to give, to be destroyed. So it can have a very negative imp implication. It can be set apart or isolated from any other part of the law. It's translated often as utterly destroyed in relation to the Canaanites. So again, you can see it's used in that very negative way. But it is translated 10 times as consecrate or devoted. So again, that's in the positive fashion, that it's devoted to God and therefore something which is of honour to him. The implication is that things devoted are off limits for free will vows and are not able to be redeemed with money or any substitute made for them. So there are things that have to be offered in whatever way God has defined. And the ties are one of those. So we're dealing here with things which are devoted. Now in Leviticus 27 verse 28, we are dealing with things which men devote. It's a slightly different word used in verse 28 to all the other occurrences of devoted that you find. So here are things which men devote. Once promised, they cannot be taken back later on. So Jephthah had devoted to service whosoever first came out of his house that could not be brought back by money. It could not be redeemed. Samuel could not be redeemed. He had to go to Shiloh. Jacob and the nation named after him, Israel, paid tithes right down through their history. And when you go to Deuteronomy 26 and verse 5, you find that when they actually brought their tithes, they would remind themselves of Jacob's vow. A Syrian ready to perish was my father. When he went out and he came back, loaded up with goods and herds and flocks, and they would go over the story of Jacob and his vow every time they came to make their tithes. And that became a statute in Israel. So in verse 28, we're dealing with things that men devote. When we come to verse 29, we're dealing with things which God devotes. And sometimes and only God devotes men to destruction. For example, the Amalekites are a classic example. The men of Jericho and the incredibly corrupted Canaanites were all devoted by God to utter destruction. Rotherham has, has as we said in verse 29, is touching anyone devoted who may be demoted from among men. He shall not be ransomed. He must surely be put to death. So you can go through the record and you'll find that God had devoted all those terribly idolatrous nations to total destruction. Once God had so proclaimed them, no man could change it. King Saul found out to his great sorrow that by saving Agag, Ag 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 alive, king of the Amalekites, that he had disobeyed God completely, and so he lost the kingship in God's eyes at that point. In Leviticus 27, verse 31, you could redeem the tithes of produce. This might seem to be a contradiction, but when you think about it, it wasn't always practical to pick up all your baskets of fruit and, and your first bag of grain and, and all the different crops that are coming on at different times and to take the first fruits to whatever the place of collection might be. So it wasn't always feasible to actually physically take all the first fruits of produce to God. What you could do is you could actually pay 120% of their value and give the money to the priests instead of actually taking the goods when it came to the ties of produce from the ground. But in verse 33, you could not redeem tithe animals. Every tenth lamb would be marked out for destruction. And what they used to do was to pen all the sheep up, on, and particularly the lambs, the firstborn lambs, and, and that would have come in the last year. So the, the firstborn lambs were all put together in one pen. And then they would be sent out through a narrow race, and there would be a shepherd there, and every tenth lamb passing under the rod would be touched with that rod which had ochre on it. And so number 10 lamb would be then the firstborn that would be offered to God, the, the tithing that was then offered to God. So if number 10 lamb would happen, happen to be a, male, a sickly lamb or even a lame one, and you were concerned about that one becoming your tithe, you could actually replace it with a better lamb. But both animals still had to be sent as tithes to the priests. So you know, there was no possibility of a, a, a smart switch going on here to preserve one lamb against another. If you wanted to replace a lamb that was perhaps not as, light, as, as, as without blemish as you wanted it to be, then you could actually send another one with it, but both still went to the priests.
It was a devoted animal. So in summary then, what we have in Leviticus 27 is that there are some things that are banned that are off limits for redemption. There are some things that are off limits for free will vows. And there are many other things that are devoted already to God. It could be a field, as we see in verse 21. It could be a devoted person or a devoted animal. If it was devoted to God, then it had to be followed through. And especially in the case of that reciprocal vow where you've asked God to do something for you and you will promise something in return, that one has no chance of redemption by money. So remember, there was to be no human sacrifice. Going back to, to Numbers 18 again, everything that opens the matrix in all flesh, which they, which they bring to Yahweh with it, men of beasts, shall be thine, that is the priests. But the firstborn had to be redeemed. So, you know, always something that went to God had to be redeemed, but a reciprocal vow um, was something that had to go, go through with. So it could not be possible to offer a human for sacrifice in any way. So Jephthah's daughter could not be redeemed. She would have to go and serve all of her life in the tabernacle at Shiloh. Now, this record of Jephthah concludes with the inheritance issue that started in verse 2. Remember, in verse 2 and verse 3, he lost his inheritance and was thrown out of it. He briefly regained it, being made head of the family and the tribe in verse 9, and coming back to a place which is called his own house in verse 34. So he came back to the inheritance of his father. What we do note about Jephthah's daughter is that she did not bewail her death. She bewailed her virginity. She lamented her inability to bear children to raise up the seed for the inheritance. She knew, like Jephthah knew, that it would now go back to the brothers in the family. And so she went to bewail her virginity. And to a Jewish, remaining childless were regarded almost worse than death. It was a great tra tragedy for a, a faithful Jewish woman not to have children and to raise up seed, particularly in the case where there was no other siblings in her family. So she went to mourn. Now notice she did not lament her impending death. She rather lamented her imposed virginity, and it says it a number of times. She could not marry and at the same time keep her father's vow to serve all her life in the tabernacle. The New King James Version for verse 39 has, she remained a virgin. And three times in this record, she bewailed her virginity. She bewailed her virginity. She knew no man. She remained a virgin. That's the emphasis of the record. It never, ever says she was burnt. It never ever says she died. Those comments about her remaining a virgin would be totally superfluous if she had been dead. And in verse 40, the translation is actually very good. The women came to lament with her, as the margin says, and this became a regular mourning through the rest of her life. So the inheritance was lost, and it went back to his brothers as she went off to serve in the tabernacle. We know, of course, that Jephthah and his lovely daughter would now have to wait for an eternal inheritance. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but saw them afar off. Whenever we vow, we must be willing to give up to God something we value. Hannah knew that. David, negotiating with Orn and the Jebusite, knew that, that it had to be at his cost. If we ever make a promise to God with less than a real sacrifice involved, or even worse, with a degree of malice involved, sometimes God requires more of us than we thought that we should give. And I believe that perhaps Jephthah's malice to his brothers had been called out by God in the circumstances that were here. Now, I want to leave you with a very powerful thought or two about Jephthah's daughter. Certainly God would never expect a faithful daughter to die for a perhaps rash vow made by her father. But there was a future task God had in store for her, something to repay her sacrifice, her loyalty, and her faith. When you do the chronology from here to the book of Samuel, it's not as long as you might think, bearing in mind that the work of 
Samson overlaps with the book of the first of Samuel. The 40 years of the Philistine domination goes from the last 20 years of the judges to the first 20 years of Samuel. That we actually have a very short period of time before Samuel arrives in the temple at Shiloh. And you can add up the, the judges, and these were what we call operative judges. They actually judged Israel. They gave decisions. They made decisions on behalf of God. They gave laws and decrees to the people. And it seems to be that after Jephthah, there was a succession of these judges without the gaps between them of Israel going off and, and committing abominations and then enemies being sent against them. And it seems to be there was a succession of operative judges. And when you add them up, you've got six years of Jephthah, seven of Isban, 10 of Elon, 8 of Abdon, and Samuel perhaps being weaned at the age of four, adds up to 35 years to Samuel arriving at the temple. During this time, Samson is over on the west as an individual fighting the Philistines. And for 20 years, he did that during the last days of the judges above. He was always a person who did it on his own. He never, ever worked with other people. And he was always a sole renegade against the Philistines. And God used him very effectively on the Philistines. But the 40 years it talks about in, in Judges 13, verse 1, actually goes right up to 1 Samuel 7, verse 13, when Samuel finally defeated the Philistines and sent them packing. So just knowing that little, little chronology that, that, you know, Samson was undergoing solitary resistance right up until the time, that, that went right on until down the days of Samuel came to lead Israel. I want to just leave you with a, a very interesting thought in harmony with the, the loving God that we know. And while he does require vows to be paid, God has a tremendous sense of foreknowledge and foreplanning, which is way beyond our comprehension. The overlapping chronology between Judges and Samuel means that Jephthah's daughter would have been about 50 to 55 when the little boy Samuel had to be left in Shiloh. And he was left there under the care of a very old, half-blind priest, overweight, who had two morally rotten sons running the place. Little boys that age need motherly affection. They need protection and guidance and care. Can you imagine what a comfort it would be to Hannah and what a joyous task it would be for Jephthah's daughter to actually take on the raising of that little boy Samuel in between the visits from his mother. Can you imagine the bond that these two women would develop? And I believe truly, as it says in the Psalms, Yahweh, our loving God, sets the solitary like Jephthah's daughter in families. And I believe that, he, that she was allowed to go to that place by the providence of God so that there would be someone to look after, little boy Samuel, in that very difficult environment of Shiloh. And we only have to see the quality of Samuel as he came to the mature years, that Yahweh was with him, that God let none of his words fall to the ground and his spiritual guidance for Israel to see the influence of two godly women upon him. So brethren and sisters and young people, our God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. Jephthah asked for a victory without fail. But God had even greater things in mind in fulfilling that vow at his request, not only rescuing the Gileadites from the Ammonites, but providing at Shiloh security, safety, guidance, and education for the little boy Samuel, who would be the saviour of the nation in his day, that he might be called a priest after God's own heart. What comfort it was to a mother like Hannah, who only saw her son a few times a year at the very best, and what a task for the faithful daughter of Jephthah, who had no seed or inheritance in this life. What a privilege to share the shaping of the spiritual life of Samuel. And so we do marvel, don't we, at the providence of our loving Heavenly Father.